There's a throng of devotees at the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, even as the national conversation continues on what a Ram Rajya means for modern contemporary India. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo Story. This has been the week of the Mandir moment, the Ayodhya moment, where the Prime Minister said, Ram aag nahi urja hai. But the conversation continues. It has indisputably been a moment of overwhelming emotion for millions of Indians. It has also been an epochal political moment. But as the debate around politics continues separately, the question to ask for so many of us is what is it about the Ramayana that is a parable, a message for modern times? When the Prime Minister invokes Ram Rajya, what does it mean for our country? What about Ramayan beyond Ayodhya? What about as mythologist and author Devdath Patnayak says, a Ram for everyone. Because there really is, as he writes so beautifully in all of his pieces, a Lord Ram for everyone. To talk about Ram, Rashtra, Ram Rajya and the Ramayan, let me introduce a very special guest on the program today. Devdath Patnayak is with us. He's an author. He's a mythologist. He's also one of the world's foremost experts on different editions of the Ramayan perhaps with one unifying message. What is that message? We'll find out. Devdat, thanks for your time. Uh, you know, I've been, of course, a big fan of all of your books, uh, all of your writings, and I've been reading them carefully uh, through this week. Uh, if there's one thing that stands out to you uh, about this week, about how people feel so emotionally about this in little villages of India, in big cities, across uh, you know, typical divides. What does this week say to you? Well, it reminds us that Indians uh, are very deeply connected with their stories. And, uh, you know, uh, any religious activity in India really deeply connects uh, Indians. And this is, of course, uh, um, the frenzy is created around it and everybody is excited by anything. You know, Indians love ceremony. Indians love rituals. Indians love yes. festivals. We participate in everything. And this, of course, uh, you know, have been encouraged to do so by a lot of people. And they sort of you become part of the moment because we enjoy Utsavas. And this is a great Utsav. One of the points that you've always made is that the Ramayan uh, was also a storytelling mechanism to bring home uh, lessons of what is dharma, what is raj dharma, what is karma, what is moksha. Uh, that 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 the power of storytelling in, in the Ramayan is in a way what makes it uh, one of the sort of most abiding, dateless epics of our time. What is that? What is that great art in the Ramayan? And again, as I say, in the Ramayan, I know you're going to stop me and say there isn't one Ramayan. So go ahead. Well, um, Hinduism is a unique religion um, uh, in that our ideas come through stories. So stories was the model that was used to communicate ideas to people. It's called the Pancham Ved. So the Vedas were restricted to uh, the priestly class and not many people even today understand what's there in the Rig Ved, in the Yajur Ved, in the Sama Ved, Atharva Ved. We know about these words, but what uh, for the common man, the stories uh, are the medium through which ideas like Dharma, Artha, uh, Karma, Maya, Moksha, all these ideas about values, about you know, the complex metaphysics of life. Everything comes to us through stories. It's if the stories didn't exist, um, Hinduism wouldn't have a framework. That's remember, it's a very, very vast land. We're talking about a very, very long land. It's, and Hinduism is not an evangelical religion. Nobody comes and proselytizes. They just keep telling you stories and the stories keep coming and they traveled across the land and different stories at different times took different um, uh, uh, shapes. Some stories became popular. Ramayana being the most popular, Mahabharat being the second most popular. Shiva's story became extremely popular. Stories of the goddess became popular. So um, these stories sort of spread across and you see it in uh, any part of India you go. Um, it's not just the texts, but it's also paintings on the wall. There are carvings on the temples. There are puppetry shows. There are plays. There are performances folk songs across india there are folk songs whether in andhra pradesh karnataka kerala 
there'll be songs about what Kaushalya sings to Ram as a baby, what does Sita sing to Ram, what are the conversations that are happening. You know, in the 1950s, when the All India Radio was launched in Bombay, um, the um, you know, Gurdi Madhgolka wrote uh, what is called the Geet Ramayan, and it became extremely popular, Ramayan through poetry. Uh, and in the Marathi uh, world, Geet Ramayan, which Sudhir Farke sang, is even today sung. It's very, very, very popular. Uh, so uh, I think there's something about stories that connect us. And you know it better than anyone as a journalist. You know how powerful stories are. And I think Ramayan's story sort of connected with people. It also worked at the royal level because you're talking about a king. And I think that's sort of, there's something about both Ramayan and Mahabharat being dealt with royal families. They dealt with kingship. They dealt with governance. Uh, and I think that's what sort of connected with people. Now, one of the things you just said is that Hinduism is not an evangelical faith. And you have always questioned, in a way, the prescriptive, uh, overly moralistic black and white interpretation of good and bad, uh, as is encapsulated in what we believe to be the virtues of Lord Ram. Uh, so, you know, uh, Maryada Purshottam, of course, uh, but you've made this beautiful point i think uh, that if ram is the uh, is the rule follower the upholder of rules there's a krishna uh, who's the rule breaker uh, so talk a little bit about that about how uh, you know basically the yin and yang of human nature the good and the bad of that probably lies within us uh, the naughtiness uh, but also the compassion the courage but also sometimes uh, maybe also the fear uh, all of these paradoxical human impulses are, are are captured through the characters of our uh, of our great epics so uh, you know um Hinduism uh, is uh, rather refined in understanding of human psychology. And that's something that we often miss. Um, you know, uh, typically uh, when we think of uh, rules and organizations, uh, even in modern management, you have this set of rules and you'll have a set of auditors telling you whether you're following the rule or not following the rule. And that seems to be the global template that if you follow the rule, you're a nice person. If you don't follow the rule, you're a bad person. But if you look carefully at how the Ramayana and Mahabharata are designed, um, uh, the, 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 the storytellers knew that it is possible to follow the rules and still be a pretender. You can use and manipulate the rules so cleverly that you always seem to be following the rules, but you're actually breaking the rule in spirit. So the letter of the law and the spirit of the law is something that the Indians understood a long time ago. So the idea of the pretender, the one, mm -hmm. the trickster who can misuse the system, pretend to be following all the rules, you know, doing everything as prescribed, but actually being an extremely cunning person, manipulative person. And if you look at the Ramayana and Mahabharat carefully, in the Ramayana, the hero or the central character is a rule follower and the villain is a rule breaker. But when Ramayana. you look at the Mahabharat, uh, the central character is a, seems to be a rule breaker and the villain is a rule follower. He never breaks the rules. He's always aligned with the rules. And you'll see in the Duryodhan playing this role of a person saying, that, you know, I didn't break the rule. I didn't gamble the kingdom. I didn't put my your wife um, mm. on the gambling hall. So there is this kind of a clever manipulation of the law. Uh, and therefore, Dharma says it's not about the law. It's about the spirit of the law. Because laws exist to uplift the meek and the poor. Otherwise, we don't need laws. In the jungle, the mighty dominate the meek. That's the jungle law. What in Sanskrit is called Matsya Nyaya. It's a very clear phrase which is used mm. in all our literature. Matsya Nyaya which translates as fish justice. In the sea, the big fish eat the small fish. That's default programming. But Dharma is when this is overturned. When the big fish take care of the small fish. Now, that creates a problem. That's not as simple as that. It sounds very noble. Oh, the big people will take care of the small people. Because the question mm -hmm. then is asked is, what will the big fish eat? What will yeah. they consume in order to survive? And that brings Dharma Sankat as a conversation. So when you talk of Dharma, you should talk of Dharma Sankat. The ethical and moral dilemmas that come. Uh, when you take decisions and uh, that uh, introduces us to the idea as to for whom are you doing these actions? What is the purpose? So when you see the Ramayana, when you see the Ram's actions are never for him. It's not driven by ambition. It's driven by responsibility, duty, accountability. So when you hear the phrase Maryada Purshottam Ram, what does that phrase say to you? 
it means someone who you know it's a um, really a tragic phrase because it means someone who cannot live uh, by his own choices but is bound by the duties he is limited by so ram is the eldest son of the royal family nobody asks him hey do you want to be king i always tell people does ram choose to be king it's imposed upon him by the you know by the laws of the land that you're the eldest son of the royal family you will be king nobody's asking hey do you want to be king would you like to be king that's not a question being asked unlike the mahabharat where there's a contention over power ram is just told one day that you will be king and then one day he's told well you should not be king your brother is going to be king and uh, ram says uh, okay and you know if you look some of the finer lines in the sanskrit version is that he's almost relieved that he doesn't have to carry the burden of kingship and he can live his own life do his own thing but then you know he, so this royal integrity comes into the picture and maryada purushottam is you know the 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 vision that is given is someone who's a caged bird he has to live by the rules and uh, sita is always considered to be the uncaged bird and really ramayan is a love story of the caged bird the uncaged bird uh, ram who is bound by royal duties and accountability and sita who is um, the forest bird she's free and she's asking him to come out but he can't he is bound by those rules and therefore even in the end of the story ram is in the palace doing his duty while his own family is in the forest and while people see it as a tragedy i say you know really they have no rules they are they are free to define their own destiny and sita is in the space of freedom uh, it would be lovely if they were together but uh, that's not how life turns out so ramayan is also a tragic story that's interesting but that you see sita as a sort of free spirit uh, and ram uh, as as the king bound by duty uh, but but then duty dharma and today we're talking about ram rajya what is the phrase ram rajya say to you well uh, um, in the scriptures a, a rajya a kingdom is a space where you uplift people so the whole purpose of kingship is to uplift if you read the bhagavata puran why are kings created so there is the story of prithu in the bhagavata puran whose father vain plunders the land for his own pleasure and the rishis uh, get rid of him and replace him with prithu who says that i will treat the earth as a cow and milk her and distribute her wealth fairly across the people and ensure that people are fed so the purpose of kingship is to uplift uh people from wherever they are to ensure there is wealth coming in so lakshmi becomes important ensure that the knowledge and arts uh, thrive so saraswati becomes important security is important therefore um, durga becomes important so the three goddesses become important lakshmi saraswati and durga and ensuring that the land is um, and people respect the law people help each other it's very important this dharma is not just the duty of the king but of every human being and dharma basically means for whom are you living your life uh, are you living your life for yourself that is ego that is ahankar and that is seen as an inferior default programming it's a de- it's a de- it's our default programming but we have to work and towards helping other people enabling other people and that's what is called a yagya in the vedic word that i help you and therefore now you are bound by debt to help me and there is a sense of reciprocity there is um, and these are ideas that uh, we are not very familiar with because but these are very common ideas in the vedic literature in the ramayana in the mahabharat and they keep repeating this that for whom are you a king what is the purpose of kingship um it becomes more elaborate when you read the mahabharata i always tell people the ramayan really makes sense when you start reading the mahabharata because they sort of a complementary epics which were taught to kings hopefully you know we ha- all know that kings think only about themselves and if you read the ramayan there are ki- other kings ram is not the only king there is the vali the king of kishkinda who only thinks about himself and kicks his brother out or ravana who only thinks about himself and kicks his brother out Uh, kubera builds the city of lanka kicks him out and uh, ravan wants his brothers uh, kumbhakarna and vibhishan to be loyal to him don't give me good advice just be loyal to me because loyalty is good and you see vibhishan's conflict saying that you know what but, but you're not doing the right thing and um, he argues with his brother and is kicked out so these stories are telling you about kingship and ravan is supposed to take care of lanka the people of lanka yeah. have done no wrong they are living on an island he's their king he's supposed to make their life wonderful he abducts a woman and creates problems and the people are like you know why should we suffer 
for your work. And that's the thing. Why do the Rakshasas have to suffer for Ravan? And the, that tells you a lot about kingship. For whom are you king? On one side, you have a king who destroys his kingdom because of his own, you know, whatever he feels should be the way things should go. On the other side, you have a king who actually doesn't have a happy family life, you know, because yeah. of you know, he makes this wonderful kingdom. And what do people give him in return? They gossip about his wife's character. And uh, it's almost like a tabloid going through where people are saying, oh, you know, but you know, Sita, she has a problem. And you're like, hey, but you're beneficiaries of Ram Raj. You're benefiting from all the good things that are happening. And therefore, uh, Valmiki is a brilliant storyteller because he's he's trying to draw attention to the complexity that when you are given mm -hmm. this great king and you have prosperity rather than enjoying it and benefiting from it, you are complaining, yo, the queen is not good enough, her reputation is stained, oh, she was, and in a way compelling the royal family to take brutal decisions, which, you know, are problematic decisions, and um, uh, which even today people debate and ask me, they've that why did this happen? Why does a Mariada Purushtam give up his wife? And I said, no, he gives up the queen, never the wife. And these are complicated statements because people say, oh, you're defending Ram. And I'm like, well, I'm not Ram's lawyer. I'm just telling you the story that was told. <laughs> thousand years ago and um, yeah. the story is trying to in, tell you about a good king not in a good fact one of the, <laughs> in fact one of the things you you wrote uh, was that this was a kingdom where women were loved and brothers didn't fight over their property yeah and, and you see this is a uh, you know around the world not just in india uh, when you read the bible there is the cain and abel story the cain kills abel over property over because he feels god favors abel over cain so the idea of brothers fighting is a glo in across mythologies around the world you find brothers fighting so vali and sugri fighting uh, mahabharat is about the kauravas and pandavas fighting the idea of brothers fighting over property you know we say this word vasudhaiva kutumbakam the world is my family that's the part one part Two is in this family are brothers who fight over property. And a good brother, a good king is someone who does not let the quarrel destroy the kingdom, who is willing to give up his share so that the others will eat. And therefore, when you read the Kalidasa story of Dilip, an ancestor of Ram, it talks about how Dilip wants, is saying that, you know, I'd rather die than let my people suffer. So these ideas of um, generosity, and thinking about the other is central. And that's what uh, prevents. Uh, and it's really a psychological, spiritual conversation. We all know it's easy to be greedy. It's easy to think only about mm. ourselves. It's our default programming, as I say. It's a survival skill. Spirituality is when you say, you know what? I want to let go. I want to be content. I want to be generous. It's very difficult to be content. It's very difficult to be generous. It's very difficult to be forgiving. Uh, it's a it's a it's a struggle. And Ramayana talks about these values through stories. Are those the traits of uh, uh, Ram Rajya for for the present times? Compassion, for every forgiveness, time, for all our relationships. In all our relationships, I think Rama and we, we try to talk it about the kingdom. I always say people don't talk about grand narratives like India. Look at your family. How do you treat your brothers? How do you treat your sisters? We know across India, you just have to go to any court of law and see brothers and fighting, fighting over property, over petty issues. Brothers not being gracious and generous enough to say, you know, my... Um, I, I, I let go of my, even if I think that I'm on the right side, I'm willing to let go of it. Now, how many of them are willing to tell, no, no, Bharat ko lene do, Rajya lene do. So it's almost as if Valmiki knows that this is such a hypothetical idea. It's almost, we make him God because normal human beings will, you know, fight like crabs over property. Yeah. And I think yeah. if you look at the Ramayana, Mahabharata, all these stories are talking about brothers fighting over property. Ram is the only one who's standing over there saying that, you know what, I really don't need it. And, he, and it's not just in Buddh Hinduism. When you read the Buddhist narrative, he comes across the, the what is called Rama Pandita. He is a man of great augustness and integrity, and therefore considered a bodhisattva. The Jains say that you know he's such a generous soul that uh, Kaikai comes crying to him, saying that my son wants to become a monk, and I don't want my son to go away. So she says, "Oh, don't worry, I'll go to my." He goes to Bharat and says, "I want to become a monk, so we can't have both brothers becoming a monk. So you stay in the palace and take care of the kingdom. I'll become a monk." Now that makes him a Baladeva. So, you know, you see it across that there is this something they're trying to present a character who does what is not natural to us. Our natural instinct is to be dominating, to be territorial, mm. to fight over property. And therefore they have 
constructed a character and presenting it through stories to children and saying, you know, ye ban sakte ho. can you try and be that? So while it's easy to admire, to emulate is very difficult. Admiration is easy and lazy, but emulation is where the real challenge is. You have written that there is a Ram for everyone, right? Uh, and there is a Ramayan beyond Ayodhya. So I want to explore this, uh, this a little bit. A Ram for everyone. What do you mean? I think it's, um, you know, a Ram at a foundational level. Remember I told you Ramayana is considered Pancham Ved, the fifth Ved. And mm -hmm. Ram basically means the soul that is able to let go of pettiness. And this, our soul, uh, you know, and our ego is always petty. It's always petty. It's always insecure. It's always scrounging and fighting. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So the uh, scrounging and fighting. So Ram for everyone is because there is a, this soul is present within all human beings. It's not that it's only present in the rich and the privileged or the only in men or only in certain sections of society. All of us have it. And I think for me, Ram um, everywhere one is that, that idea when, this, when, when they were telling the story, they're trying to tell us that all of us can be that person who can help his brother. Um, and Ram is not just the character. We have to see other characters in the Ramayana which demonstrate Ramness, yeah. if I may say. There's Shabri huh. who feeds Ram for no reason. She just finds someone who is hungry and says, hey, why don't you eat some food? Or you have Jatayu who um, uh, uh, tries to stop Ravan and gets his wings cut. Now he's trying to save someone uh, and you know save, uh, uh, what does he get in return? Um, and you don't see that um, uh, uh, easily. Hanuman, Hanuman in the Kishkinda kingdom, you have Sugriva who wants the kingdom. You have Vali who wants the kingdom and they're fighting over the kingdom. Uh, and Hanuman doesn't want anything. He's more powerful than anyone else. But he can just knock off everybody and say that I'll be the emperor of the world. Uh, in fact, there's a folk tale where uh, his mother asks him that you're so strong, you could have defeated Ravan on your own. And uh, why didn't you do that? Why did you have to go through the charade of building a bridge and fighting a war? And he looks at his mother and says, because it is Ram's story, not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, uh, through these folk tales, they're presenting these very uh, wonderful ideas or, you know, the story of the squirrel. We hear, tell this to children. Oh, the monkeys were carrying these boulders and throwing it into the sea. And the squirrel comes with little pebbles and tries to store it. Mm -hmm. And everybody's last laughing and saying, oh, what's your contribution? And Ram yeah. goes and, you know, pets this very famous, the lines of the squirrel. And we all, whenever we see a squirrel, we'll tell the children, oh, Ram ke marks hai. And the thing is, the story is very powerful because I use it in management class. I say, he's looking at the person and saying both, he looks at the monkeys and say, you are giving me 100%. He's giving me 100%. How are you superior to him? Simply because your contribution is 80% of the project. So you yeah. are seeing it from a very different point of view. You have the strength to carry mountains. He doesn't. But both of yeah. you all are giving me 100%. Are you saying they should not be admired because they're tiny? And I think that tells you a lot about Ram's character. And this is the folk tales being told in our stories. So mm, we look forward to leaders like this and elder brothers like this and parents like this who uplift us and tell us uh, that you can be a nicer human being. Uh, you don't have to scrounge and fight over property, um, you know, which is what the story begins with. Where sir, Kai Kai says that my son shall be king and then regretting it because it causes this rift and destruction of the family. Um, and then wondering, oh, my God, what have I done? Because, you know, is it wrong to have ambition? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and these are the questions that Ramayan provokes you to ask. Is it wrong to have ambition? Is it wrong to just agree with your father and walk away? You know, young people tell me, oh, I think Ram is just walking away from things. He doesn't have grit and determination. Mm -hmm. You see that, you know, we are we would like to have default programming because we are being told mm -hmm. to be ambitious and to mm -hmm. fight for your rights is true. The ability, we don't talk about generosity and contentment in any MBA college. No MBA college teaches us contentment, generosity, resilience, uh, integrity. It's just not there. I, I go to a lot of management schools. Nowhere. Harvard doesn't have a course on contentment. 
Aparigraha, uh, <laughs> as the Jains will say, Aparigraha is not there. Um, and uh, good business really begins with contentment. A content man is a great leader because he doesn't think about himself. He thinks about other people. He thinks about sabko parosa hai ki nikhana. And that's a very Indian idea. Um, even in South Indian temples, even today, some of the temples still practice this ritual where before you close the temple door, you will always say, has everybody eaten food? Sabne khana khaya ki nahi khaya. Or Sita ki raso is so important. Where Sita says, yeah. has everyone eaten? And I, I think these ideas come through the Ramayana. Um, we forget these little stories that are helping us be better human beings. I think that's what Ramayana brings to the table. Politics aside, all these stories and drama aside, I like the stories. And I think we should tell our children these stories. They're very, very powerful stories. I have goosebumps listening to you. But you talk a little bit also about... Uh, you know, the, the multiple Ramayan, the multitudes, as it were, uh, uh, that, that when we say the word Ramayan, you're actually talking in multiples, not singular. Uh, and you've written about how, you know, the, yeah. there is the Ramayan of the Gangetic Plains uh, of, of what we recognize today loosely as the North Indian states. But there is there are also different tellings of the Ramayan. Yes. So uh, Ramayan, um, the, you know, the oldest manuscripts are there in Baroda Oriental Society. And in the 19th century, people started collecting what is called the oldest Valmiki Ramayana and started analyzing it. They realized that there was a northern version, there was a southern version, there was an eastern version. The many verses were not common, many stories were not common, and they came up with a critical edition. And that's there. It's published and it's the oldest Ramayana. It's over 2000 mm. years old. But then we find Sanskrit plays being written on the Ramayana. So you have Bhasha, Bhavabhuti writing these plays of this great noble king like Mahavir Charitra and um, Pratima Nataka. There are these very famous Sanskrit plays. And then you have the Prakrit works uh, in uh, Jain, amongst Jain. Vimala Suri writes amongst the earliest uh, Ramayana is writing over there. So these are royal documents that are emerging. And they start in the 4th, 5th, 6th century. Kalidas writes the Raghuvamsha. Then you have the Puranic stories. In the Purans, you start finding Ram being presented as an avatar of Vishnu. So now Vishnu is being connected to Ram and Ram is becoming part. You mm. find artworks emerging. And... Mm. Um, you know, for example, 5th century, 6th century, the Gupta period in the Madhya Pradesh area, in the uh, um, uh, UP area, you have these old temples which have the earliest images of Ramayana. And they're very different. When you look at the Sita there, it's like, oh, it looks so different, but it's the Gupta period. You come to uh, Elora Temple, Kailas, 7th century, 8th century, you find Ramayana being depicted on these walls. You go south, Hampi, uh, Karnataka, you start 7th, 8th century, you find Ramayana. You go all the way to Java, Indonesia, and Prambanan Temple, 8th century, you start finding Ramayana on the walls. 12th century, you go to Cambodia, Angkor Wat, you see this gigantic mural of the Ramayana appearing over there. So Ramayana is now spreading and you start finding different versions in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. In, in By the 10th century, you start seeing regional languages emerging and you start seeing um, the Kamba Ramayana, Tamil Ramayana during the Chola period. The Chola uh, kings talk about Kamba Ramayana and after which you see the Telugu Ramayana emerging, the Kannada Ramayana emerging, the Uriya Ramayana, many hundreds of Ramayana in Odisha, Kritti Basa Ramayana in Bengal, um, Kandali Ramayana in Assam, there are uh, uh, Maharashtra's Bhavartha Ramayana, Giridhar Ramayana in Gujarat, and of course in the 16th century, uh, Goswami Tulsidas writes the very famous Ram Charitmanas in the Avadhi belt, which becomes extremely popular. And um, <clears throat> So you find this Ramayana sort of emerging as stories across India. And then in the 18th, 19th century, novels start to appear. For the first time, you have the novels appearing. And novels create a new kind of Ramayana. And I always tell people we should separate 19th and century, 20th century Ramayans from the previous ones. Because the previous ones had a sense of respect for Ram. It was not a critical thinking of Ram. It was more of what does tradition present him as. You don't challenge tradition, you accept the narratives as they are. What happens in the 19th and 20th century is they start being seen as mere stories, which can be mm. analyzed in any way you like. And therefore you have uh, authors like Ma Michael Madhusudan Dutt writing Rab uh, Meghna uh, which is really looking at the Ramayana as a Greek epic. Uh, and you have these stories being written. Then you have, you know, different kinds of Ramayans being written in the 19th and 20th by a lot of myth, uh, what is called mythological fiction as a genre mm. appears where you wear a lawyer's hat and you start saying this character is good, that character is bad. So you find these Ramayana emerging constantly. 
Uh, and I'm just telling you the literary texts. I'm not even telling the folk narratives. I'm not talking about the temple performances, the dances, the folk songs, um, uh, the which have not even been recorded because they're oral traditions. In Mith mm. If you go to Mithila, there are wedding songs which are only on Ram. If you go to Andhra Pradesh, you have these women when they are uh, doing labor in the fields, they are talking about Sitamma, that is Sita. Uh, so you have these uh, you know, these uh, kind of village songs, which uh, mm. only when you read academic text do you get access to them but it's just it's just unbelievable the depth and the width of the Ramayana which exists and therefore it really reaches every corner of India and that's what makes Ramayana very very special now the way the the the, the mandir uh, has been in a sense celebrated <clears throat> across India I think it captures in a, in a way that pan India interpretation following intertwining with culture that you that you just spoke about but you've also uh, you know been speaking about and focusing on how this emphasis on religious roots you know this moment being called a civilizational moment some have called it a second republic uh, and so on uh, this sort of need for reviving your sense of self through your faith this you see as a global pattern that we have to see the context of what's happening uh, when we look at other countries also. How do you how do you explain this? How do we locate this conversation within the larger globalized world that we live in? You see, um, uh, in the early 20th century, we had suddenly science as a subject emerging, solving a lot of issues like you had antibiotics, steam engines, uh, computers coming. And we thought the world was changing dramatically. You know, till the arrival of science, religion ruled the world, right? Re um, religion was what ruled the world. You had um, the Islamic empires stretching from India to Europe. You had the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughal Empire. You had, uh, you know, the 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 empires, the Christendom of Europe, managed. you had the Orthodox Church in Russia. So the world was controlled by religion, especially. And then suddenly science comes along and everything changes dramatically. You have industries appearing. You have, as I said, antibiotics, steam engines, computers, electricity coming. The world is changing. Then you have humanism appearing, new ways of thinking appearing. People are talking about justice, equality, democracy. And we thought the world is going to become a happier place. And suddenly, by the end of the 20th century, people talked about globalization, the world wide web, and everybody was going to resor exchange resources and the world will become a better place. So when I started my career, I kept hearing this word globalization and we'll all be part of this wonderful family. People wrote books like the earth is flat and, you know, everything will change. But we realized nothing really changed. The inequality just was amplified. Your trillion dollar companies emerging in countries where suddenly for the first time you saw homelessness. You suddenly saw the rich countries have homelessness. Rational countries like Germany have extreme inequality when you look at the wealth divisions. Uh, and suddenly you realize, hey, you know, science and humanism does not take away inequality. And then people said, maybe religion was not that bad. At least it gave mm -hmm. hope to the people who were the losers. You know, the people who didn't get anything. I have not got education. I've not, you know, the whole life I was told democracy will make my life better. Republic will make my life better. Science will make my life better. Education will make my life better. But really life has not got better. I am in the same slum where I was born. And I'm angry and I'm upset. And it's happening globally. Where do I go? Science does not give me an answer humanism's you know rationality doesn't give me an answer modern and postmodern philosophies which are, are only in the universities don't make sense revolutions don't make sense and i say you know god helps me and i i i go to this because religion really addresses psychological issues insecurities and human beings we are insecure beings even when we are insecure we rush towards something which gives us hope and Around the world, whether you if you're a Muslim, you'll go towards the Quran. If you are a Christian, you'll go towards the Bible. You need a religious structure to cope with the horror of existence, the you know, the things that go wrong in life. What the about science, the things that go right? Well, what about the things that go right? For those, then you get even more nervous that it can go away tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I'm trillion. Yeah. I'm the uh, richest man today. I may not be the richest man tomorrow. See the Ramayana. He's about to be the king of Ayodhya. And on the eve of the coronation, he's told, please leave. 
go to the forest for 14 years and you're like, oh my God, what if I'm told to go to the forest for 14 years? It shows the horror of it. Or suddenly your brother kicks you out of the kingdom. Kuber, the king of Lanka, who has all the gold in the world, is kicked out by Ravana and thrown out. And you're like, that can happen to me. And uh, history is constantly telling you stories about how people have been kicked out of their positions of power, how nobody remembers you when you don't have the fortunes. And therefore, suddenly the, you see the insecurity across, right? You see the powerful people in our country thinking less about their jobs and more about post-retirement benefits because they are insecure and they are clinging on. to. When you don't have God, you have you think of money and power. And those who don't have money and power go towards God. And you see even the rich people inside temples asking God for more and more and more because greed never ends. And therefore, religion comes back. And that's what's happening around the world because I think science and humanism and rationality and reason did not keep its promise. It overpromised. It underdelivered, yeah. And therefore, religion comes in. And with religion, tribalism comes in. It's not just religion which comes in. The dark side of religion is tribalism. And uh, yeah. it creates these tribal. And why do we have tribal groups? Tribal groups are like a pack of wolves. And what does a, why does a wolf pack emerge? Because it's hungry. And a wolf pack allows you to hunt the deer better. Or a herd of deer. Why do they form a pack? To protect themselves from being hunted. And tribalism emerges that way around the world. So if you're seeing religion transforming into a form of tribalism, you see that in Russia happening. Uh, when um, the Cold War happened and Russia suddenly found itself in the open sea and nobody, you know, the Cold War Americans declared they had won. Russians felt lost. They'd lost power. How did they get power back? They suddenly claimed the Orthodox Church. And how did Orthodox Church uh, declare its power? By saying, all gay activities are evil and we shall block them. So suddenly the liberal was attacked. You found this one uh, signifier called the LGBTQ movement and you said, okay, we will just reject them and prove we are back in power. And that's, you see how religion works. You see this in Africa a lot. The Islamic and the Christian communities in, I always tell people in Africa, are they, do they, they have, you know, they have three identities. They have a national identity, they have a religious identity and they have a tribal identity. And we are always told that the, your national identity is a real identity. Your religious identity is a false identity. But actually, it's their tribal identity which matters. But they're not allowed to. And they, they, because, you know, you have got these national uh, boundaries dividing. So these are things that are now resurfacing in the 21st century, unfortunately. Because um, the people, we almost feel we were tricked by words like globalization. We were tricked by words like humanism, human mm. rights. Um, it seems like a clever game that was played by people to corner resources. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, let me end by uh, by asking you, uh, you have always argued against a kind of puritanical, uh, orthodox, moral science interpretation of these great epics. Uh, you know, if there was one thought you'd like to leave uh, everybody watching with, uh, you know, as it, this has been a week of uh, celebration, but if you think about Ram as you have described him, uh, it should also be a celebration that therefore touches the person who has nothing, as well as the person who probably has everything. So just want to end with that uh, last thought from you. You know, there's a story which is told by the Hijra community about Ramayana. So I said, everybody has a Ramayana story. So let me tell you an oral story of the Hijra community. Um, Ram goes on Vanavas for 14 years. And just before leaving, the whole city follows him saying that this is not right. You should not be thrown out of the kingdom. And he says, all the men and women of the kingdom, please go back. And he proceeds and crosses the river and he proceeds for his one of us. When he returns on his Pushpak Viman, he suddenly sees a group of people outside the city and he goes and sees them and he notices that um, they are the... Um, uh, they are uh, the hijras. They are the uh, people who we in North India is called kinners, but people who don't identify themselves, who are non-binary people, uh, the homosexuals, the gays, the lesbians, who don't fit into the queer community. And he looks at them and says, why are you outside Ayodhya? Why are you not inside Ayodhya? And he says, you told all the men and women to enter. You would never included us. Mm -hmm. And Ram feels so bad. And he says, no, in my kingdom, everybody is welcome. You will come with me. Rama, uh, Ayodhya will not be complete unless everyone is included. And I think that's the story or at least that's the hope of the queer community. So you suddenly see a very different story being told. It will yeah. not be part of a Sanskrit epic. It won't be part of a Brahminical epic. But it is the Ramayana of a community. And that is as valid as any Ramayana anywhere.
I love that. A Ram for everyone, but also a place for everyone. That Ayodhya as a kingdom is not complete unless it has that space for everybody. That is that is Ram Rajya. Uh, thank you, Dev. That I could listen to you for hours, but you have uh, other things to do. And so we let you go reluctantly. Thank you so much for talking thank to you. us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Mojo's story has always made a commitment to its viewers to go to where the story is. And as you can see here, we are at the epicenter of the Israel war on Gaza. We are right at the front line, about one mile from the Gaza Strip, as is the Israeli military gets ready with its tanks and its gunners to begin its final frontal assault that will take troops into Gaza. As we said, we are not like other organizations. We believe in giving you all sides of the story objectively and as much as possible from the ground. And that's exactly what we're doing here, covering the biggest global story today from the epicenter of the war zone. So please, we need your support. Support us, become a Mojo member, subscribe to us, spread the word, and thank you for your support.